Hi there, Chris from Totally EV, and today I'm joined with Adam Bond, CEO of AFC Energy. Adam, thank you very much for joining us on this interview. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. I'm going to jump straight in and say, why did uh, AFC Energy choose to produce the H-Power charger? And was there demand beforehand before partnering up with Extreme E? The, the instigation, if you like, of the H-Power system was really driven not so much by EV per se, but more by a need or acknowledgement that the market for stationary temporary power was moving away from diesel and that there was a, a growing number of um, regulations in the UK, in, in Europe uh, and, and overseas as well, where the diesel generator, which has traditionally been seen at you know, construction sites and uh, in remote locations and backup power, you know, that there was an end date. In, in, in much the same way that there is an end date in many Western economies for, for diesel cars. And so the idea behind a, a fuel cell system, which was capable of generating zero emission power in applications that have traditionally been the domain of the, of the diesel generator was something that you know, really prompted us to create what is now known as, as, as the H-Power system. The number of applications for H-Power is, is obviously many uh, from, we mentioned uh, you know, mining, remote locations. But a couple of years ago, uh, we sort of took a view that with the number of EVs uh, hitting the market, and obviously it's much more today than it was even, even then, um, there was likely to be constraints on, on local grids. And, and we've heard anecdotally that was the case. Um, and so rather than you know, some of the new car manufacturers, you know, launching their products with a diesel generator sort of hidden behind the, the bush, charging the, uh, the cars for, for, um, for, for their launch events. And then we thought actually maybe there's a longer term opportunity here for, for providing a, a grid augmentation or supplement uh, where the grid was constrained and prevented people from rapidly charging cars, especially the sort of ultra rapid charging rates we're seeing now. Um, and also providing a, an alternative where the grid actually does not exist. Uh, and, and I guess the collaboration with Extreme E, which I know we'll get onto later, was really driven by an absence of a grid in some of the most remote locations on, on the earth. Brilliant. And, and actually, following from that, um, what, you know, how's, give us a bit of a background of AFC Energy for those people who might not know. Um, and also maybe a bit of background about yourself as to how you're appointed um, as the CEO later down after you. I think you're a non-executive director initially and then you moved into a CEO position a few, few years yeah. later. So, so AFC Energy is really a, 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 has been a technology company for many years focusing on the generation of clean power from hydrogen, utilising hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, it's, a, it's a variant on the same system that we, we, we've heard over and over again about you know, putting man into space, the, the system that NASA used on the space programme. And um, what we're using uh, that system or that technology for is, is to do, you know, create a, a green alternative hydrogen generation source or, or power generation source using hydrogen. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we've had a few twists and turns over the years in terms of technology as most, you know, clean, clean tech companies do face from time to time. Uh, but now we're getting to a point where we're, you know, commercially, uh, you know, able to start looking at deployment into, into our key markets. As you, as you rightly said, you know, my, my background with AFC was originally as a non-executive director. Uh, AFC is listed uh, on, the, on the London Stock Exchange. So uh, I was a director for, for, for a little while. And uh, I think the, the, the board took a decision that, you know, the, the market that we needed to focus on, we needed a bit of a review. The technology needed a bit of a review. And, um, and so I was asked to step in in, in 2015 and, and basically do do the work required to get the system from the lab into the commercial mainstream market. And uh, I, I think over the last couple of years, really, the, the team at, at AFC have done a great job in, in really driving that agenda, getting the technology to a point, bringing on partners that we needed to bring on, and now starting to create commercial relationships for, uh, for, uh, for, for the deployment of our system and, and creating brand awareness through, through um, you know, EV charging and, 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 and the like. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's gone very well. That's brilliant. And funnily enough, moving on from that question, I, I guess it's it's worth talking about your partnership with Extreme E. So you, you said about commercial partnerships. Um, why did you what what inspired you to to partner up with Extreme E, or why did Extreme E choose you? Um, well, I, I've, I've related this once uh, previous, but it was it was really an email that I received 
uh, on a on a plane um, at Heathrow. I, I just landed uh, back in the UK from from a couple of weeks in, in Australia, where I'm, where I'm from, in, in January. And uh, upon landing, you, you tend to look at all your emails when you, when you uh, turn your phone back on, and um, and there was an email there from Extreme E. Uh, and I think we launched our EV charger back in in December uh, of last year. Uh, you know, they were going through a bit of a process of reviewing all of the options on the table for them to charge their vehicles in an off-grid environment. And clearly, you know, diesel was not on the agenda. Um, and so they had to find something that was uh, you know, sufficiently advanced in terms of its technological development uh, and was capable of being deployed with, with an element of robustness uh, from uh, 2021 onwards. And so uh, we started communicating in, uh, in January. We started to exchange specifications on what it might look like, as, as you can imagine, Taking a system uh, from the from the Arctic to the desert, uh, yeah, there, there are there are some challenges in that, and and this has probably been one of AFC's biggest challenges, and and, and you know, funnily enough, it's probably one of our first in, in a commercial world. So, it was uh, it was quite an interesting process, and, and and one that you know continued for several months, whilst we you know provided some level of assurance that we could put the system into into the ground and, and make it work and charge the cars up at, at the rates and to the specifications that extremely wanted. So. It was very much an initial, um, you know, them contacting us. But but then, I mean, obviously, when you when you receive those sorts of inquiries, they you know we're, we're very very pleased to be working with such a great uh, great organisation and a great initiative. It's I've got to say, it's really good to see you guys partnering up, and it's it's you know great for for someone who likes motorsports like myself, um, and obviously in terms of renewable energy, the fact that you're using hydrogen to power on the H power charger, and the fact that that's going. With, well, hopefully in terms of renewable energy then being passed on to the Odyssey 21, which is the SUV, to race around the world in crazy conditions and with a fantastic array of different drivers. I think, yeah, I, I personally think it's a great decision. So ho- hopefully um, in 2021, we'll, we'll see the, the H-Power chargers there. Well, the ones kind of like right behind me, um, sitting a- alongside the the Odyssey 21, which is over here. <laughs> so Absolutely. that's that's really good. I think I think the end, at the end of the day, you know, sport plays a, a really interesting role in, in bringing awareness to some of those environmental issues that you know drive the markets in which we're we're working. And um, you're not only to be supporting a, a world class motor race. You, we've seen what's happened with Formula E and the, the massive success that that has been over the last few years. And you know, we see no difference for for Extreme. It's it's a it's sort of the next step in in uh, in motor racing. And so to be able to support a, a, a motor racing event of, of the profile that we, we, we're talking to with Extreme E, but also to be raising the awareness of some of the environmental challenges that you know, are moving the whole world economy towards a, a decarbonized electrification type mode of transportation is, um, you know, it, it's, it's a rare opportunity and one that you grab with both hands. So, yeah, as you say, very very pleased to be uh, collaborating with, uh, with Extreme E on this. Thank you for the answer. Um, now, following on from that, well, in terms of transportation, so you know, the, the charger unit itself, having seen it in person, is quite large. Now, how is that going to be transported across the world? And how many charger units do you expect to be providing Extreme E or the organization um, for, for their races? The, the, the system that you saw back in December when we launched was, was uh, containerized. And, and I think you know, containers are not the most aesthetically pleasing of, of uh, of uh, you know, units to house house fuel cells, but they are very functional if you want to if you want to pick them up and, and, and transport them around in a in a fairly robust uh, way. And uh, the part of that sort of progression in a in a diesel generation displacement or transition market was to have something that was more or less the same in terms of its transportability and, and robustness. And so that's where the, the shipping container came from. The, the Extreme E uh, system that we will be deploying next year is very much uh, built on the same type of model of a, of a container. Uh, everything is within, uh, it'll be a couple of containers with a, with a battery system and a, and, and a fuel cell um, and, and a few uh, spare parts and, and, the, and the like. But we'll be moving that around from, from site to site in the containers. Uh, the containers will be housed inside of a, a ship, um, which uh, Extreme have uh, announced they, they'll be, they've uh, acquired a ship, the um, St. Helena, and the St. Helena will go from port to port. We will uh, have the system <clears throat> unloaded at uh, port, transported however many uh, tens of or hundreds of miles to the, to the site of the race. Uh, AFC will have a couple of uh, representatives uh, operating the system 
on behalf of Extreme E. And um, you know, along with the rest of the, the pit crew, hopefully uh, you know, it'll, it'll be quite a, uh, hopefully a fun and enjoyable event for those involved. But we'll uh, then have the race day or race weekend, um, charge the cars, uh, pack them back onto the um, onto the uh, the boat, and, and then off to the next port. So very mobile, transportable system. Uh, it'll be in, in place for a, a week or two, um, and, and then shipped onto the to the next location. So. You know, the, the whole idea is that there'd be enough uh, power to, to charge up to 12 vehicles. Um, those, those vehicles will be basically race teams um, you know, charging as, as and when they require to, to uh, complete the races. And, uh, and so the system will be with, with the battery, which will basically act as a bit of a, a, bit of a buffer for the fuel cell, which will be running 24 uh, seven, will we'll house the, the electricity for, for when the cars come in and, and charge up in the pit. Just to... And in, in, in terms of that then, how many cars can you charge, uh, specifically for the Odyssey 21, how many cars can you charge yeah. per singular unit? Um, well, the, the, the next, so the reason we integrated a battery system with the with the fuel cell is that if you, if you run the, the, the battery system, I'm sorry, if you run the fuel cell system 24-7, you're obviously generating power a lot of the time when you don't need to uh, need to charge the vehicles. And so the, the battery basically acts as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a medium through which the energy is stored. Um, and then if, if, your, if your battery is sort of 300 kilowatt hours and, and uh, you know, you've got, let's say, a 50 kilowatt charge rate required, then, you know, 300 divided by 50, that's, that's, that's how many cars you can charge. Uh, so in that case, you'd, you'd be doing six at a time. Um, now, not every car can be charging at the full rate. Not all will be going from zero to 100% at the same time. So you'll have different profiles of charging depending on which, which um, stage of the event that you're, uh, you're in. So you know, there's no one single answer how many we can, we can charge, but um, yeah, we, can, we can charge quite a few quite quickly. Um, within the constraints of the of the particular racing uh, event. So yeah, thank thanks for you for that. In, uh, that it's uh, the information. Um, really appreciate it. And what about in terms of the charging ports? Now, you know, normal EVs have different charging ports that are associated with them. Um, do you know what charging port you're going to have to use, or is it going to be some sort of direct transfer, like not your regular, let's say, Type Two or CSS charging port with the vehicle, given that you know it, it's a race vehicle over here. So Extreme E are actually looking after the the actual uh, charge pedestals, for want of a better term. Um, that's the that's the bit they've uh, they've sourced themselves uh, through uh, an organisation called Kempower. Uh, so they will be utilising Kempower units on site. We will uh, plug into those and, uh, uh, and and then that's that's that will uh, charge the vehicles uh, from there. So. Uh, we won't be supplying that. I mean, we, we as a company, we don't produce the uh, the actual EV pedestals. We we're, we're semi agnostic as to who uh, who we use, but uh, certainly Kempower, I mean, excellent organisation, great um, great technology, and um, and you know, great to be working with them on this uh, on this project. So in that case, then you don't have you haven't been talking to Spark Racing then in terms of because they develop as far as I'm aware they're going to be developing the car. Um, they're developing the chassis. I think they might be doing the the battery as well. Um, the battery being done by Williams um, and 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 Spark, as you mentioned, are doing the the vehicle. Yeah, no, we've spoken to we've spoken to those guys. Um, you know, it, it's it's make, making sure that everything is is aligned. You, you don't want to work out that um, you know, part of that chain has has miscommunicated, and you work that out in the middle of the desert somewhere. So you know, I think there's a there's a big team effort involved, and uh, you know, we. Uh, yeah, I mean, whilst we're obviously newer to the party than, than, um, than some of the others, we're certainly um, very much part of that process now, and it's great. In that case, then, in terms of operating so sort of temperatures, because as you know, well, Extreme E is going to be operating in winter conditions and desert conditions as well. Like it could be really hot, really cold. Um, what operating temperatures can your H power? units actually run on and furthermore what's the actually the um optimal operating temperature that it, it can run on is there anything that they should well they will have to avoid or things that they're limitations that they might have when it comes to charging the vehicle so our systems i tend to be quite flexible in terms of operating in in high temperature low temperature environments um you know some of the extremities in which we're going to will will we'll test the boundaries i'm sure but you know we're, we're fairly comfortable that the that the 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 specification in terms of temperatures that we've been given, uh, we can we can meet and satisfy. So I don't necessarily see there being a problem there. Our, our fuel cell itself uh, runs 
at about you know, 70 degrees centigrade. So, um, you know, so, so heat won't worry us too much. I think once you start getting uh, into those sort of colder environments, we have to think about how we may want to keep the, the, the fuel cell system uh, warmer, um, which, which may use just a little bit more uh, sort of power in terms of parasitic loss from, uh, from the system. So we've built a bit of um, spare capacity into the system as well. But no, we, we, don't, we don't see there being a big issue. I think where the issues um, can sometimes start to occur is obviously we still use air um, uh, as part of our, um, our oxygen within the air. So as, as you go up into some higher climatic conditions, you just need to be mindful that you, know, you, you may get a reduction in the amount of oxygen that re will react in your fuel cell. But, um, you know, again, we've, we've gone through each of the different locations uh, with Extreme E. We've, we've tested out our, our, the hypothesis of our fuel cell in each of those locations. And, um, yeah, so far we don't, we don't see there being any material issues. But, uh, but again, it's, it's all about creating the robust story, if you like, of, of how we are looking to displace diesel as a, as a feedstock. And so, you know, part of your challenge in displacing diesel is, is you, you don't just displace it in central London um, or, or central New York or uh, you know, the suburbs of you know, wherever. You, you have to be operating in extreme conditions where the grid does not exist. And that's where diesel has for so many years taken on a, uh, an important role um, in terms of powering those locations. We, we have to be able to operate in those conditions in order to be you know, a viable, relevant, alternative to to the diesel genset and finally just one more question i would say that has extreme e given you any sort of requirements or specifications that they need specifically made for them on the h power charger unit um from you guys and have they said oh we need so and so specifications um obviously you guys can potentially tailor make it i know you, you've got a scalable design as well for depending on the different type of charge units um have they given you any sort of requirements or specifications or has it been really well we like your solution kind of off the shelf yeah the we have made a few changes to the system um to be able to to operate effectively within their specification uh, we've, we've put a few more fuel cell stacks into our um, 10 foot containers that you know we you know traditionally wouldn't um you wouldn't necessarily have needed to do. Um, certainly, you know, weight and, and, and dimensions and things like that are uh, are important when you're moving things around and up and down mountains and wherever you wherever you're going. So there, there's certainly been a number of specifications that we've been working with. Um, you know, some of the some of the mountain conditions. You, you know, the, the the narrow paths in which these the trucks will have to take equipment from the port to the race location you know, does create some issues logistically. So we've got to, you know, work within those constraints. And, and I think um, our system has been uh, somewhat made in a bespoke manner or designed in a bespoke manner. Um, but equally in doing that, you know, we've also found other things that we could, you know, maybe even improve the existing systems on. So it certainly hasn't been a, a, a bespoke uh, exercise for the sake of, of making a bespoke product. It's It's been quite helpful in a number of different, different ways. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's been too much... I mean, fundamentally, they need power in locations um, that they can't get diesel, they can't get uh, grid power to. So, as long as we can meet that specification and, and operate in the conditions and work within the logistical constraints that they have, then and we've, we've been able to demonstrate that, then you know, I, I think we've got a system that's sort of right right up their alley in terms of what they need and, and delivering a product of, of value to them. That's great. Thank you so much for the insight, Adam. And again, thank you for your time as well. I know your time must be quite limited. Um, and it's a bit of a different interview um, that we're used to. I guess it's a virtual interview. I honestly can't wait to see it in action, quite literally, um, to see the H power unit charging up the Odyssey 21 and both female and male drivers going ahead and racing around um, extreme conditions. So yeah, really looking forward to it. And again, thanks a lot for your time. And um, I, I really wish you the, the best of luck and hopefully maybe see you soon in actual person when kind of lockdown measures kind of die down a little bit, at least in the UK. Uh, fantastic. Well, Chris, thank, thank you very much for your time as well. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, presenting you the product uh, in a few months time for the, uh, for the first season of Extreme E. Be brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adam. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.